Okay, well, thank you. This is the story of my father, Max Stern, who survived the Holocaust. So just so, so you have the full background. So my father had two older brothers. He was the youngest of three. So there was Chaim, Isaac, and Max, my father. And he had two younger sisters. The youngest one was Sivia, and I don't remember the name of the one that was older. You'll, you'll need to know the names in a minute. So my father and his family came from a town called Gora Kavalia, which is about 30 miles southeast of, Pol of Warsaw in Poland. The, the town itself was about half Jewish, half not Jewish, and the Jewish people in the town were Hasidic. So they wore the black hats, they had the earlocks, they were very, very religious. And my father was Hasidic, his family, whole family was, except for Isaac. Isaac wasn't religious, and he went and he joined the army, the Polish army. So in 1935, uh, Chaim had a wife and two children, and he left Poland to go to what was then Palestine. He wanted to help build what would ultimately be the new country of Israel. So he left his wife and sons and went, took a train, went to Palestine. Then September 1939, Germany attacks Poland. And my uncle was fighting for the Polish army. He was a cavalry officer. You know, cavalry is, they fight on horseback. So he was sent to go fight the German tanks with horses. <laughs> we all know how that turned out. So uh, my uncle got wounded. He was taken prisoner by the, by the Germans. Uh, and, but the Germans, believe it or not, were very disorganized at the beginning. They had all these Polish prisoners, didn't know what to do with them. So they were letting them go, and, and a German soldier asked my uncle, uh, where do you live? And he told him, all right, I'll give you a ride. So my uncle, meantime, was all bandaged up because he got shot in the head, but not, it didn't go through, it grazed him, so he was all bandaged up. Then he fell off his horse when the Germans were pulling him, pulling his horse, and a tank, German tank, drove over his hands. But it was very muddy, so his hands sunk into the mud, but they were badly torn up but not broken. So he had bandages on his hands and then a bandage on his head. And so the German soldier said, we'll take you home. Where, where do you live? He told him the town, Gora Kavalia. So they were driving to the town and my uncle, and I don't think the soldiers knew he was Jewish, and he told the story that he's sitting, and I'll get to my father in a minute, but he's sitting in this truck with a German driver and another German soldier and he thinks they're just going to going to kill him. They're just taking him somewhere to kill him. So, and my uncle spoke German, so the one German soldier said to my uncle, are you hungry? Yeah. Why would you ask me such a question? <laughs> so they took him, they said, fine, there's a, a farmhouse over there, let's go to the farmhouse. So they were in Poland. So the German soldiers are banging on the door and some Polish woman answered, said, you know, what do you want? She says, we're coming in, we want food. So they just broke, you know, basically broke in. And asked my uncle, would you like bread and butter? They said, sure, anything, <laughs> yeah. So they told the Polish woman, give him some bread and butter. So they took care of that. Then they got back on the road and he, he got home. They dropped him off. He, this was very strange. Why would they just let me go? But anyways, he, we went home and he went to see his family, my, my, um, my father and then his parents, their parents. And um, he said, we need to get out of here. I just fought against the Germans, I don't trust them, we need to get away. And my grandfather, my father's father, said, uh, we don't need to go anywhere, everything's going to be just fine. So, for the next six months or so, things really weren't that bad in Poland. Every morning you had to go wait in line for bread, and yeah, people were getting beaten up, but there was no, they weren't rounding up Jewish people. And, uh, and then my father and his father, uh, had to spend some time, they sent him to this little work area about two miles from their house. It was strange work, you had to move rocks from one place to another. They just wanted to keep the Jewish people busy. And, um, and one day, and oh, there was a curfew. I mean, every Jew had to be home by sundown, when the sun went down, or you're going to be shot. That was, a, that was a law that the German armies had passed. So one day, uh, there, my father and my grandfather are in this rock quarry, the rock quarry, and uh, my, father's, my grandfather said to my father, I'm a little worried, it's getting dark, and we don't have enough time to get home before sundown, we're going to be shot. So my father, he was probably 
15, 16 years old. He's very brave. And he looked around, he saw in the distance a German officer. And my father spoke German. So I went up to him and he goes, excuse me, sir, what time is it? And the soldier said, how dare you talk to me, Jew? Go back to work. So he went back and he went to the sergeant that was guarding them. He goes, sergeant, did you just see me talking to the officer? The sergeant said, yeah, what was that all about? You're not allowed to talk to him. He told me to tell you to let us go. So if the soldier would have turned to the officer and said, did you say I should let him go? And he said, no, they would have shot him, right? But they knew, my father knew, they're dead anyways. If they, if they stick around, they're not going to get home in time for sundown. So the sergeant said, fine, go. So they went, got home in time. And so this went on for a few months, and my grandfather was, happened to be uh, a tailor. A tailor is somebody who sews and repairs clothes. And one of his customers was a German officer, a captain in the regular army, not the Gestapo or the SS, a very nice man. And he used to come to the house every week or so and drop off his, his uniform, and my grandfather would help him. And um, one day he came and he said, uh, Mr. Stern, I'm, I'm under orders. As of tomorrow, I can't do any business with you because you're a Jew. German soldiers are not allowed to do business with Jewish people. And, if I could, and he brought gifts for all the children. And he said, if I could give you any advice, it's get as far away from us as you can. You can't go south, you can't go west, I would go east, which is where the Russians are. So my uncle heard that, he goes, see, I told you, we need to go. Because I'm taking Max, my father, and we're going. We're going to go east. We have cousins in Russia, that's just where we're going to go. And my grand and he says, let's take the whole family, let's just go. My grandfather said, I'm not going. I can't leave, i got two little children, his grandchildren from Chaim. I can't leave, the children can't walk. And it's going to be okay. The Germans will leave, just like they've done throughout history, and everything will be fine. So on the way out of town, um, my father was, there were some German soldiers standing around, and somebody grabbed my father, and my father had the, the locks, or the hair. And a Polish woman was making very terrible statements about Jewish people with the German soldiers standing. They threw my father down, and she pulled out his hair. You know, the, the side of the locks, so that was very painful. So they started walking. So they walked from where it was Warsaw, actually just trying to, they didn't know where they were going, they just knew they were going east. They knew they had cousins in Minsk, which is in the Ukraine, I think it's the Ukraine, or Belarus, so, uh, I apologize, I don't know which country it's in, but, and we had some cousins there, and they hooked up, and they stayed there for a few days, and one of the cousins was, uh, a wonderful lady named Riva. And they were a distant cousin, but they knew the Germans were going to get up to there eventually. So she said, I want to go with Isaac and Max to Moscow. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to be here when the Germans come. So the three of them were now together and they were walking. So as they were walking, actually before they got to Mintz, my father and my uncle got stopped by German soldiers in the forest. And a uh, German soldier pulled his gun on my father. He had the gun to his head. He said, you're Jews, aren't you? Just trying to run away. My father didn't say anything. He said, they're just going to shoot me. And he goes, said to my father, do you have any money? I said, I don't have any money. I'm kind of running for my life. I'm just a kid. So the German soldier took out a equivalent of a dollar, a Deutschmark. He said, here, get out. So he started running. Then the three of them now uh, had to cross some big lake in the Ukraine to get to the other side. And it's a big lake. And they saw a Ukrainian man with a boat. So they went up to him and they said, uh, Sir, do you mind taking us across? And the guy said, uh, Sure, I'll take you across. So they get in the boat, they go about halfway, and the guy stops rowing, pulls out his, his, uh, his gun, points it at my uncle and my, and my father. And he says, You're Jews, aren't you? Just trying to run away. And they didn't say anything. Just gonna, so I should just kill you. Nobody cares about Jews anymore. I'd throw you in the lake. Who cares? They didn't say anything. Do you have any money? My, my father, and they were very poor, but my father had this cheap watch that his father had given him for a birthday or something many years ago. So my father said, here's this watch. It's all I have. I was fine. I'll take it. I took him to the other side. So they went to the other side and then kept going and they made it to Moscow. And um, so Moscow is in Russia. The Germans never made it to Moscow. They came close, but never made it. 
So they were very poor, they had no money, they had no food, nothing, so uh, they all split up and were doing different jobs. My father worked on a farm for a while, he was a fireman, and then he had some very bad luck. He was selling soap, hand soap, on the black market, which is illegal. And this is wartime in Moscow, it's hard to get anything. So if you could find, even soap, you couldn't find, you couldn't go to a grocery store and buy food. Things, things were being sold, people had things they were carrying in their coat, hey, I'll sell you some cigarettes, whatever, people were just trying to survive. So he got so caught selling soap on the black market. No trial, threw him in jail. And he's in a jail cell with 50 men, and there's no heat, there's no air conditioning, and your bathroom is a bucket in the middle of the, middle of the floor. And they all have to sleep, it was very small, so they all slept like this, one against the other. And my father used to tell the story, if somebody got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, then, so he'd get up, and the whole, all 50 would close in on each other, <laughs> and you wouldn't dare wake these guys up to get back <laughs> into your spot. <laughs> so he, uh, he didn't know how he was ever going to get out. There's no trial, they don't care. They throw you in jail and just let you stay there. So my Riva, who ultimately became my aunt because she married Isaac, she used to bring food for everybody. She used to cook food and bring food for everybody in the jail cell, all 50 men. You can't bring food just for Max, you have to share it. And these are tough guys. So, and then my uncle, meantime, was doing anything he could. He was raising money, working, and he was trying to pay people off, a policeman, a judge, anybody, to get my father out of jail. And it took about a year. Finally found the right guy. He said, all right, took some money to let him go. So they left. And then when the war was over, now the Russians announced every non-Russian has to leave, get out. Poles, I don't care who you are, Poles, Ukrainians, get out. So they had to leave. Said, Where do we go? They figure, so they decided, well, let's just go back to Poland. It's all we know. So they went back to Poland. They didn't go quite to the town they were in. They were hurt. They heard it was still pretty bad. So they found a town somewhere near their, their town. And there was no police, there was no army, there was nothing. Homes were empty, there was damage everywhere from the war. If you found a house, just take it. So they found this big house, the three of them moved in, and they could tell the house was owned by a Jewish family, but the Nazis had taken it. There were pictures of Hitler on the wall, because so they knew a German officer, probably an SS officer, probably had moved in there. And they stayed there for six months, again, just trying to find work, to find food, whatever, and they didn't know if they were going to just stay there forever or what. Then they heard there's bands of Polish people looking for Jews to kill. They didn't, they wanted to, they, the Germans didn't, they want to finish the job. This is bad people. And they were coming into this town, so they said, now what? We can't stay here, they're going to kill us. So they said, let's just go. They heard rumors that there were camps being set up in Germany for, for Holocaust survivors. So well, let's go to Germany. But Germany, the, the Europe was now split between the West and the Russians. So the Russians had controlled uh, Poland, Russia, parts of Germany. They'd taken over, and, you, and it was very, very difficult to get through. If you were in Russian-occupied Europe, you couldn't get to the other side. But they had to get to the other side. So they risked their lives. They went through Czechoslovakia, which was under Russian control. And somehow they managed to get through a barbed wire fence and made it into Germany. And they heard of a displaced persons camp and they went and stayed there. And there was, if you're living in a camp, it's not, it's not like summer camp, but it wasn't a concentration camp. The Red Cross was there, Jewish organizations were there, they were bringing food from North America, trying to help these surviving people, giving them medicine and food. So my father was there, he was there for probably three years. And the idea was, if you're in one of those camps, you're not supposed to stay there permanently. You have to get out. You have to go to the United States, you have to go to Canada, you have to go to Argentina, maybe you go to Israel, any country that would take you, actually it was Palestine back then, any country that would take you, but you can't stay in this camp. There's no, there's no life in this camp. It was not an easy life. And people were getting sick and people were dying. And, the Red Cross and these Jewish agencies were doing everything they could, they could to save people, but these people were very, very sick. So uh, my father managed to just stay there for a while, and, and he had a little bit of a, a life. He can go out at night, and 
and he finally got himself where he was a little bit healthy and he <laughs> went into town and he met a German woman and they became friends and one day he told her, because she said, where are you living? Why do you live in this camp? And my, my father spoke very good German. So she was all confused about he must be German. And he said, well, I'm a Jew. How could you be a Jew? I don't see any horns. You were told all the Jews have horns. But she grew up under Adolf Hitler. And the, the Nazis had told German people that the Jews were like the devil. And, and she, she couldn't understand. She couldn't, you're a nice person. I don't know how you could be a Jew, she told them. Uh, also in that camp, he uh, told me the story that um, in the shower they had soap and they brought in a new kind of soap. And he's washing his hands and it left a terrible film on his hands. And he asked somebody, what is with this soap? And they go, the soap is made from human flesh. It was made from Jewish flesh. And he almost freaked out. He couldn't believe it. He knew something was wrong with this soap, but the Germans did that. And um, then, so it was near the end of his stay there, and his, um, his brother, Isaac, got permission to go, I think he got permission to go to the United States and to go to Canada. He wasn't sure which way he wanted to go. My father wanted to come to America. So he went to, but first you have to pass a medical exam. So he went to see the American doctor who was in the camp, and my father had terrible legs. He had all that walking, he had varicose veins in his legs. It just looks like you can see the veins, it was, and if you don't take care of it, you can get very sick. So the American doctor said, we can't take you, because look at your legs. You could be, you know, the American people are going to have to pay for your health care. We can't have, you can't come in. I'm sorry. So he was all depressed, and I can't go to America, where am I going to go? And he was telling somebody in the camp, the Americans won't let me in, because look at my legs. And somebody said, I know somebody who had the same problem, and he got it cured. But the cure only lasts for 48 hours. And the father said, I'll do it, whatever it takes. I can't stay here. So he says, the catch, though, is you have to go into town and you have to see the do a special doctor. The doctor was a Nazi. And supposedly, he killed Jewish people. But now he's not. He's supposedly a doctor. But if you want to take that risk, he's the guy to see. So my father said, well, I've risked my life so many times. I can't stay here. I'll die. So I might as well go. And he went to see this doctor, and he remembers lying on the table, and the doctor took out the, the big needle. He said, this guy could inject me with poison, and nobody will. Jews are still dying. They're dying of disease, and another dead Jew, who cares? But I can't stay here, so whatever it takes, if it works, great. So uh, they the doctor injected him, and it worked. And he went to the Canadian doctor, and he passed. And Canada let him in, and that's how he got permission to come to Canada. So that he came to Canada with nothing. He just had his clothes that the Red Cross had given him, and that's all he had. No money, nothing. Starting a new life. But he, till the day he died, he was the happiest person I've ever known. <laughs> he had lived such a horrible life, but he was very happy. Thank you for listening.